Hello and welcome to FuturePod. I'm Peter Haywood. FuturePod gathers voices from the international field of futures and foresight. Through a series of interviews, the founders of the field and the emerging leaders share their stories, tools and experiences. Please visit futurepod.org for further information about this podcast series. Today, we have two of our previous guests returning for a conversation. Alex Fernani in podcast 89, who is located at NUS Business School in Singapore, and Luke Vandelaar, who we spoke to in podcast 103, is at the University of Southern Queensland in Australia. Welcome back to FuturePod, Alex and Luke. Thank you, Peter. It's good to be back. Hi, Peter. Really a pleasure to be back. Great. Alex initially posed Luke this question. Does futures and foresight need to be taught and researched at universities? What could be gained if it was not? Okay, Alex, let's get started. Do you want to explain what's behind that question? And also, I just note that you've phrased it in in what seems to be an unusual way. Thanks, Peter. Yes, this question came because recently I have seen a lot of professionals in our community asserting that foresight should not be in a university or or perhaps should be just confined to practice because it's a very practical discipline. So that is the reason why I was interested to explore this theme even further and particularly with Luke, who is an experienced researcher and thought leader in Forset in a university. I was very interested in his viewpoint as well. So my rationale in posing that question in the way I have posed it, and that is uh, what would we gain if we didn't teach and research Forset in a university, is the following. So yes, I get that Forset is very practical, but That does not mean it cannot be researched and thought in a practical way. There actually is a way to teach Forset and actually research Forset in a way that we can gain when we practice it. And this goes a bit back to what we talked about in our last conversation, Peter, about the resistance to scientific theory and to the establishment in the futures and Forset. What I think is, as many others have argued as well, not just me, the futures and foresight community resist universities, resist the establishment, and resist scientific theory. Now, how is all this connected to practice? Let me explain. A lot of futures and foresight practitioners are unclear about what theory is, scientific theory, that is. And... They are not trained in the social sciences research method. They are not interested in doing science. As Tessa Kramer wrote in her very insightful thesis, they are reluctant to professionalize because they think that futures and foresight does not belong to any field. It's a very holistic discipline, right? So they enjoy being outliers. Now, this is all good, but on the other hand, it also is detrimental to practice because that idea of engaged scholarship, as Andrew van de Ven conceptualizes, is absent in the community. And engaged scholarship is that way of creating theory that is useful for practitioners. So it's engaged because, as Andrew van de Ven said, we look at a problem in our organization, and it's probably related to, you know, reimagining ourselves in the future or our future strategy and so on. So something foresaid related. We look at a problem and then we come up with a theory to create um, a model to possibly solve that problem. So it's a loop, right? We, we look at reality of an organization or a community mm-hmm. or an institution, and then we create a model and a research to come up with a solution. So it's very pragmatic, actually. So theory can be very pragmatic and context dependent, unlike many think uh, that theory is universal, but it is not. It's very context dependent or can be context dependent in the case of engaged scholarship. So by disregarding theory and connection to science and the establishment completely, we also disregard this very practical way of teaching for us. And at the end, we, we are detrimental to practice. So this is what I think would be lost, you know, if we didn't teach and research futures and foresight in a university. But I would be very willing to hear 
uh, Luke's point on this as well. Thanks, Alex. I'm so glad you've asked this question. And certainly in the way that you've asked it, it allows us to step into the position or the perspective of both the foresight scholar, the foresight practitioner on the one hand, and then let's call it the traditional academic, the university scholar on the other hand. And it's in stepping into those perspectives, in my opinion, that we can start unpacking this very real issue, and that is resistance from both sides. I'm not sure if you've experienced this. There is a non-traditional perspective which is progressive. It's seeking to address civilizational issues. It's participatory. It's activist orientated. And so from a foresight practitioner's perspective, in my opinion, the resistance to this becoming a mainstream university endeavor or teaching it in universities stems from their perspective in that sort of outlying position. They like to be outliers. They don't want to be mainstream. And they feel that being mainstream is accepting the colonized uh, future of the past, if I can put it that way. So you've got this resistance from the field itself, certainly in the practitioner perspective. But the question that you've posed, I think, could and should be more, um, could be better answered from those within the academy that resist the teaching and research of future studies or foresight. And that is because it's, it's essentially, and this has been my experience, and I'd like to know what your experience is, it's been my experience that within the academy, we are also somewhat of a uh, lone wolf backslash outlier, and it stems out of the sort of ontological and epistemological problem of futures in that there is no such thing as a future fact. So how can we endeavor to theorize it? So I guess before answering what can be gained by not having it in universities, I'd like to, I guess, start by saying we've got these two perspectives and then you've got your really good question in the middle. Should we not be looking at the perspectives and more specifically, the perspectives of the academy, which is essentially either going to embrace or reject our standpoints. What is your experience on that? So I'm really glad you brought this up, Luke, because this is how we can unpack the problem. Of course, the problem is made of several components, right? several aspects. And I would argue that, as you said, the resistance of Forset to be included in the establishment is equally strong as a resistance from the establishment to include foresight as a discipline in academia. So, of course, there are many facets uh, to look at this. I would say that, as you said, we should definitely hear the viewpoint of those who want to resist the dominant paradigm in academia, and that is why in futures and foresight practitioners or even academics do not feel that they want to be included in that mainstream command and control, very positivist yeah. paradigm of research and theory. And I hear you because I remember in the last conversation you had with Peter, you really fleshed out this problem really well when you said that when you joined a PhD, your school wanted you to do quantitative research. And so you said, how about positivism? So they really are always trying to cater to this almost completely objective view of reality without considering that subjective interpretations are also valuable. Futures and Forest fits right in into that debate because, as you said, the future does not exist, so subjective interpretations are valuable, and for that reason, for the fact that Futures and Forest is mostly a subjective discipline, then it's regarded as not scientific. So all of these are parts of the problem, right? I would say that my experience, to, to answer more your question more directly, my experience has been just like yours, right? The resistance from both sides, both from the establishment to uh, welcome Forset and from Forset to welcome the establishment. But my proposed solution to that is to appreciate the fact that the establishment itself is 
full of counterforces, counterforces that actually understand that the paradigm of ultra objective and reductionist research, the positivist claims are outdated. And so that is why we should do something that is more action oriented, oriented to solve problems. And that is, uh, again, going back to my concept of engaged scholarship. So that what I want to try to say is that the establishment itself is coming up with this solution that is very much in line with the beliefs of the futures enforcer community, trying to do action research in organizations. At the end of the day, futures enforcer practitioners are going in organizations, trying to change and improve daily reality, making them more sustainable, improving their resilience and so on. And that is very much in line with the rising conscience of the establishment itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes uh, terrific insight, Alex. And it, it prompts me to respond in saying that almost controversially, while there has been the growing awareness, consciousness that things as we knew them have changed. Positivistic notions of linear change have been uh, upended and no longer exist. It has forced the establishment to start thinking in these ways. And, and in the futures context, we're starting to see the futures dimension as a priority in research yeah. grants. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. actually industry in a sense and governments that are pushing the establishment to start thinking in terms of futures. But here's the thing, and this has been incredibly troubling to me. Engaged scholarship is all about critical discussion, disagreement, debate. And what I've seen disappear largely out of mainstream academia is the ability and ongoing discourse of disagreement. So while on the one hand, some of the stakeholders of universities, industry, society, governments as representatives of the public are pushing for a futures discourse because they know there is a uh, non-linear dimension to the, the, the current times. It's the academy itself and its lack of constructive and critical debate, which is actually the problem here. So in my opinion, both with the futures community, and look, I believe we can nudge the futures community along as long as we speak their language. But that to me is less of a resistance or a problem in the field. But on the other hand, I think we should be pushing really hard, challenging mainstream academia to start thinking in these terms. Unfortunately, they have a tradition which favors um, a viewpoint which keeps on raising the ontological and epistemological problems of the field back at us and saying, you're not. And so it's a, it's a tough gig, in my opinion. What would universities lose? I think the bigger question is, what would the students and researchers accommodated by universities lose? If that pushback was so strong and, and you became victim to that, I believe we'd lose a really good scholar in futures. Interesting conversation. I'm going to throw a provocation in here, which is, and picking up, yeah, you know, Alex's point that if there's resistance to bringing a scientific theoretical understanding to futures work, both inside university certainly, but also outside, is part of what that's about. And this is just a purely, as a practitioner, ex-academic observation: is we actually don't, we very rarely evaluate anything we do. Yeah, you know, the sense that. For many disciplines, the measure of a theory is whether in practice it produced the outcome. Yeah. And I wonder whether one of the quirks of our discipline, if we want to call it that, is that we almost never evaluate whether an outcome was achieved in such a way that we could then use that learning 
to basically build more theory or improve theory. Yeah, I think that that raises the other point I think I wrote about in one of my recent publications. And certainly Alex has raised in his discourse with the field. I am concerned about that. That's true. I guess I was taking the university perspective and that of the academy. My argument in the Futures uh, Journal um, article recently was that it's almost a sounding board or a the practice of futures is a reflection of our work as academics. And if that practice is misguided, using the wrong phraseologies, unable to associate their work with good scholarship, it becomes a reflection of the field in the academy and affects our legitimacy in the argument of inclusion within the academy. Does that make sense, Alex? Absolutely agree. I think you phrase it exactly right. And I couldn't add anything more besides probably just uh, a metaphor that I think would flash out what we're talking about here. When I did research in my experience, I noticed that what I thought would happen in, say, a scenario intervention or in a foresight method actually was very different from what the data told me. So what does this mean? It means that oftentimes as practitioners, we are biased. We think that a particular intervention might be good, and then the participants are complimenting us after the intervention because they want to be polite, but in reality, it didn't really work as we wished. And we don't know that because we didn't do any more objective evaluation, as Peter just said. So that is bad because then we go on a very long way and we keep doing a mistake. So I remember, if I may just now say that metaphor, I remember that when I was practicing Kung Fu, I actually was a Kung Fu practitioner. When I was practicing Kung Fu, I was practicing with a master. And for one summer, I remember the master left the city. So I had to practice by myself now. Then at the end of the summer, I, I met the master back again. And he said, Alex, actually, there is a core movement in your body that is wrong. And you have assimilated all the other techniques of the style wrongly. So you have to go back to the original point, relearn the core movement, hmm. and, and then start learning again all the other techniques because the core movement of your body, the, the body core is moving wrongly. So you, you got all wrong. The whole summer was a huge mistake. So for a few months, I actually had to relearn my core body movement in this particular Kung Fu style that the master was teaching me until I mastered the core body movement. And then I started relearning all the fundamentals of the style. Now, to circle back to four-step practitioners, is it possible that sometimes we believe that our particular intervention is working, but it is not working? And then we build up a career on that and, and on that mistake because we never actually objectively evaluated that. Mm -hmm. And so eventually we have to go back and relearn the fundamentals. This would be a huge problem, but it is very likely happening because we, we're not evaluating what we're doing. We have to demonstrate that we can do what we claim we do. Yep. Uh, I think that's a fantastic metaphor and it definitely um, resonates with my understanding of this question of the link between practice, what we claim we do, what the outcome is, and our legitimacy as a field. And that has been an ongoing concern. It's through scholarship that we can potentially rectify that. And in terms of your metaphor, it is only through scholarship and disciplined inquiry that we can become the masters, not out of any patronizing uh, perspective, but as a servant to the field. And I'm very concerned as well about our ability to communicate the disciplines of our field, if I can use that phrase. I've not only been a scholar of futures, but quite a prolific practitioner in industry contexts. And I've seen firsthand what you're talking about, assumptions that have been made, uninformed assumptions that have been made in practice that have 
unfortunately led to a problem with legitimacy when we then uh, go into similar networks. And then through good practice and evaluating that and recording that and bringing it back into the academy in a disciplined way would improve our chances within the academy. Yes, while I started this conversation focusing on the academy's resistance, it's probably a reflection of my own bias in the sense that I've been trying, as many of us have. You're an old hand at this. If you read the journals... One of our fundamental methods that is written about if any futures and foresight process is analysed, it is the scenario. (laughs) It's Mm. kind of, you know, it isn't hard to pick up any journal at any particular time of the year and find articles on scenario process, both scenario as theory and scenario as outcome. And they're the most singular and most identified foresight and futures process. And yet, and I'll put my hand up here as an educator, I'm not sure when we taught it, when we learnt it, we were taught and learnt it such that we could evaluate it. In other words, we're, we're taught how to do them, but I'm not sure I taught and I'm not sure I was taught about what we expected scenarios would do. And Graham Molitor had a special issue of futures where he said, looking back in his career, he's not sure scenarios were worth the trouble. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it is most singularly the most dominant futures discourse that's been published. Attached to it, though, Uh, is what I'm confronted with. And now I'm going to give an example of my own. What I'm confronted with is that there's a whole convergence of futures with strategic management and this notion of strategic foresight. It's an incredibly problematic area for us in terms of our legitimacy because there is an assumption in the sort of foresight practitioner toolbox that we are not only the facilitators of developing alternative images of the future, but, hey, wait a minute, we're also the decision makers. And, and that is an incredibly damaging assumption for the field because I am not aware of any significant futures practice where we've moved from the conclusion of developing alternative images of the future into positions of resource allocation and corporate decision or policy decision making. It just doesn't happen that way. And uh, unfortunately, it's a very dominant discourse to assume that we have that within our methodology. We don't. If you go back to the Juvenal and other icons of the field, It's all about images of alternative futures. Hmm. That's where it starts and stops. Now, the problem is that I come uh, along and I go into a a corporate board environment and I mention the utility of futures for the organization and through some prior experience, I'm immediately... um, dismissed, or at least the audience is only as engaged as I struggle to get them to see what it is really we do. So I come back to this, the question, which is our practice is a reflection that grants us legitimacy. And, and it's also a fertile area of data collection for us to be able to take evidence that can contribute to theory building. And we're not traditionalists. We're not traditional scholars or traditional academics in that sense. But we can still use scholarship to promote the field. And ultimately, at the end, if if it doesn't get taught, it doesn't get mainstreamed, I think that the beneficiaries of futures, which is humanity, will, will not be gained by that. I think on, on this point, and this is a very sensitive issue, whether we, we are using scenarios or not, 
I would agree and disagree with you at the same time. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So I agree with you in the legacy of future studies, as in the tradition of the Jovanel, Gaston Berger, and and then eventually the critical school with Sorheil yep. and others. We have a very strong emphasis on producing these alternative images of the future. That is completely true. But on the other hand, I also appreciate that in the uh, intuitive logic school of scenario planning and uh, all of those methods that originated from Europe as well and North America, starting from Rand to the the perspective in, in France, eventually there is a connection between scenarios to strategy. So there are methods that allow us to at least connect scenarios to strategy of the organization. Um, Now, I agree with you in that we are not the decision makers, but I think it should also be made clear that we are facilitators that are able to connect uh, those alternative images of the future with some form of strategy. Foresight should be an input to the strategic decision making. So again, if you want, if one takes a bird eye view of the field, not just considering the more hardcore future scholarship, then including also other methods of scenario planning, and particularly the intuitive logic school, then one can see that we have something to contribute to how we use scenarios. There was this amazingly provocative but also truthful book by Thomas Shermack, just published, uh, titled using scenarios and in the book it's perhaps the first book of on scenario planning i've read that is not about scenario building so it does not focus so much on building scenarios it starts the book by saying i don't care how you build scenarios let's just focus on how to use them in organizations and then he lays out a number of methods to do that and it makes it very clear that the scenario facilitator should also enable that dialogue so if we consider that part as part of the field of the larger field of futures and foresight, then for sure we have something to contribute in terms of evaluating whether these alternative images of the future we build actually are usable. And so this uh, connects back to the importance of evaluating what we do, to know that we can do what we claim we do. I think that's important as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And there's no question of a doubt that the outcomes of good futures work needs to have utility and inform, in the case of the example, uh, the strategy process. Mm-hmm. Absolutely correct, Alex. Agree more. And, and the same can be said in the sort of policy domain and social enterprise domain, etc. It's the utility of the outcome. And then to be able to walk it to use a metaphor, to walk the results into the next decision-making process uh, that is part of our field. You know, question of a doubt, but we've got to call it the right thing. And, and that's where I get a little bit concerned in this space of strategy. And it's the most obvious space where I see this crisis of legitimacy. It does untold damage to claim to do something that we don't do. Yeah. And, and I feel that universities in particular have a role of going, taking humanity back to what it's innately capable of doing. You know, futures is a human capacity. It's something that we're born with. Socialization has meant that we become less foresightful as we get older. Universities have the role of being able to reignite, encourage, build that human capacity to envisage the future. And so there's a bigger picture here. Number one, the future isn't the domain of a select few people that call themselves futurists, number one. Uh, Number two, academia or the academy isn't the domain of only those that uh, adopt a positivist worldview. The academy is a coming together, in my opinion, of debate that promotes humanity and human progress. So what can universities gain by not teaching futures? Clearly, we've got a biased view. We've got to come up with something a little bit more rigorous. It, it gains nothing. 
it gains nothing. In fact, what it does gain is a deterioration back into uh, the dogmatics of traditional uh, uh, higher education. Uh, yes, yes, Luke, you mentioned this point about the importance of using foresight at large in the social system. So everybody should do foresight. So I, I think we should also unpack that a bit because I, I know you you might have the same viewpoint here, but maybe the listeners might actually not. So I want to unpack this further because this is very much connected with democratization of the future. This is something that we talk about a lot. And oftentimes democratization of the future is described as a polarity that cannot absolutely exist together with professionalization, right? So basically we should democratize the future. Everybody should learn it. And at the same time, for this reason, we shouldn't have any specialist. Everybody should be a specialist. So I think this particular viewpoint is very uh, detrimental uh, because democratization doesn't mean that a profession that is, does not exist. Actually, the two are uh, mutually beneficial to each other. Uh, we actually need to specialize to achieve improvements in order to teach Foresight. So I like to mention a lot the metaphor of the medical doctor. So of course, sure, everyone should know the basics of medicine. It's impossible to argue against it so that they don't put lime and chili pepper on a wound when they scratch their knees. But at the same time, shouldn't our society have specialized medical consultants when personal medical problems go beyond what one can manage with, you know, time and resources constraints. One cannot do a surgery on himself or herself. So, of course, we should have those medical professionals, and that's doctor. We have them. And the same goes for a specialist. But democratizing futures for everybody does not mean that we should not have these specialists when organizations run into problems about their own role in the futures and what they're doing. So I think the two actually go together, not against each other. I think it's an interesting metaphor to, to to look at medicine. People should be interested in their own health and take care. And there also are professionals who are regarded as being specialised in. I'm going to bring it back. Part of the reason you are a specialist is that you've proven you can do it. <laughs> and as mm. a specialist, you are measured and accounted on the effectiveness of your treatments. We give specialization to medicine because we know this person is a specialist because they actually get the outcome. I come mm. back to the notion that we can say that we're professional futurists, but how can we prove that we actually are professional if we actually don't have the ability to actually measure outcomes? Yeah, Peter, that's a great point. And, and, I think that's that, as you said in your earlier intervention or your earlier question, that is part of the problem of the field. And it's something that Alex and I come up against daily. And that is the ability to, within the academy, promote work that can set out um, those theories and those assumptions that then put us in a position to be able to evaluate our work uh, and others to evaluate their work and for us to establish benchmarks for practice. But as you're in the field, any notion of benchmarking or professionalization in futures, there is tremendous resistance to that. And that's one of the challenges that we face. Is that your experience as well, Alex? Yes, yeah, and we have unpacked this this resistance. And when I say we, me and my co-author Thomas yes. Chermak, and then the following debate, and to, to take to step into the shoes of practitioners who resist uh, this objective okay. evaluation of the things we do, I do get it. I, I I was in their shoes actually. There was a time where I actually resisted scientific uh, theories. And eventually I understood that it's pointless. So at the beginning, I, I was trying my best to say, but what do you say with a theory? We don't know. Not, not, we don't know for sure because everything is subjective. I use the postmodern claim very often. And, and then I realized that there are ways to 
to debias a theory, right? There are ways to reduce the subjectivity and there is meta-analysis, for example. So by yes. learning science, what I'm trying to get at is by learning science, I have understood why uh, it is useful and I have seen myself in a different light because at the beginning I was resisting uh, the objectivity uh, because in a way indoctrinated with very relativist claims and so I, I get it why practitioners or some other maybe academics in the field resist science. But then actually my point on this is that if you learn science and if you really understand what it can do for us, then you also appreciate it can help us to demonstrate what we claim we do. And again, just to disambiguate, science is not like the truth right it's a process that helps us to get at the truth and we may never get at it mm. but by doing it by doing more and more triangulating results and having academic discussions we can get closer and closer right so that's the process it's not that i do a study on a scenario plan intervention and that's gospel that's what we should sell to to others it works that one study is not enough so to put the question back to you, Alex, you've now explained that this is an important part of the academy and being an engaged scholar. So what do you think the universities gain by not teaching futures? Yeah, I would say they're not gaining anything. Instead, they are speeding up their collapse as the dominant overly objective and overly reductionist paradigm and i would say possibly the most uh, problematic attribute is overly oppressive paradigm is obsolete if futures and foresight managed to get its feet in the establishment and i'm suggesting that it should do it by trying to demonstrate uh, that what we do works scientifically then we could join forces with those parts of the establishment that realize that the old way of doing science is obsolete and speed up this, this change. Because as you said in your previous podcast, whenever you try to do a PhD, uh, oftentimes this overly positivist belief lurks back. They want you to uh, do a certain kind of research. Any other kind of research is not considered. They wanted to publish in certain journals. Any other journals are not considered good. So this is oppressive, right? And we mm. can fight with those parts of academia that have already realized this. And when I say we, is the Futures Enforcer community. And we do that by getting into the establishment. The only way to defeat your opponent is to fully embrace your opponent, become your opponent, to understand your opponent. So we have to become the establishment before we want to improve the establishment, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And in order to join the establishment, you need to meet its benchmarks for what mm. makes a good engaged scholar, while at the same time rejecting dogmatic notions of uh, oppressive paradigms of the past. And I must say, it, it is possible. I see it happening around me all the time. All one needs is the critical mass to affect the change. Yeah. As you, the qualitative tradition has been fighting for its rightful place in the scientific method since 1960s was when it really emerged and, and, and gained a foothold. Mm. It's taken 60 years for us to get to this point. I believe we're at a juncture where, and obviously we don't include the hard sciences here. We're talking about the social sciences. And I think we're in a space where within the social sciences, we can gain a foothold as long as our work is defensible. And that's the important part. Have the courage to put your work out to peer review, as you've done, Alex. And, I, and I, as I said, I admire the work you've done over a very short period of time. But if more of us can do that, we can certainly start uh, gaining a foothold that we aspire to. And, and I think it is a, a noble aspiration. And I take your point around specialized futures practitioners or foresight practitioners. I take your point on that. And I agree. I, I don't see it as mutually exclusive to the democratization of the future. But for us to develop skills that make us specialists and 
to further empower others as our primary objective or purpose. I think that's what it's all about. And, and I know I'm, I'm talking to the converted in the whole community of futures. We all aspire to that. But I, I do come back to this question of legitimacy. It's a real problem for the field and, and more work conducted in a disciplined way often in universities, can only help improve that situation. So can I thank the, can I thank the, the peer review for wrestling with this slippery question, the, the notion of legitimacy, professionalism, measurement, evaluation, and also the open nature of the future and the democratic hope and normative aspect of future's work. But thanks for starting the conversation again i put this conversation out to the community we would love to have a chance to have someone a previous guest want to come back on and keep the conversation going but to you guys thanks very much for at least uh starting it thanks peter it was really a pleasure what luke just said was really well said i really hope that conversations like this will push into that direction and really a pleasure to talk with luke yeah, wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alex, for posing what was a slippery question, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity and inviting us in there. Yeah, I hope this conversation continues. This has been another production from FuturePod. FuturePod is a not-for-profit venture. We exist through the generosity of our supporters. If you would like to support FuturePod, go to the Patreon link on our website. Thank you for listening. Remember to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. This is Peter Hayward saying goodbye for now.